Thank you, Sarah. Katrina, thanks so much for being with us and congratulations on uh, your first day as a publicly traded company. The stock now up better than 16%. Got a sheet from the NASDAQ here. It, it's hard to come by the exact data, but you might just be the youngest female founder CEO to take a company public ever. But all that aside, Stitch Fix is at the intersection of retail and big data. Tell me, why is it important to have this fund, uh, this funding now to grow the business? Absolutely. Um, when I started Stitch Fix, I, I was looking around and saying, how are people going to buy clothes 10 or 15 years from now? And I didn't see that solution in better stores, and I didn't see that solution in searching through millions of pairs of jeans online. Um, and this idea of personalization, of getting to know people, getting to know products, and generating really good actionable recommendations at the intersection of those two things was something that I felt like was the future of retail. Um, and so we're really excited to take that business and to be able to kind of share that with a broader audience now. And for people who aren't familiar with the Stitch Fix model, and they're gonna be fewer now that you're public, um, you can choose how often you get basically a, a, a box of clothes that are customized to you partially through what you've told um, your algorithm, uh, what, what types of clothes you like, your sizes, etc. Partially through a stylist who's then gone and picked stuff out for you. The, the frequency ranges from every two to three weeks to every couple of months, right? Where are people most often choosing to be in that continuum and, and where do you expect them to be? Yeah, we see a lot of variation in the ways that people engage with Stitch Fix. Um, so you can get you can get shipments on a monthly cadence. That's not necessarily a healthy cadence for all people to shop. That's a lot of clothes. I like shopping that way, but not everybody likes to shop that way. Um, you could get things on a quarterly cadence. You can also get things a la carte. And so I style fixes myself, um, and I have clients who will come for special occasions or come for kind of specific things they're looking for. And then I have other clients that are more consistent. Um, so we really think about the frequencies is really just matching the ways that people engage with Stitch Fix and making it most, most convenient for them. You style them yourself? I do. For, for friends or from ra for random strangers? For both. In fact, in huh. fact, we have some clients here today, which is which has been very fun. A client that um, I've been styling for for years, and she had no idea that I was styling her fixes for better or for worse. And she's celebrating <laughs> here with us today, which is very fun. Is that important for you to do? Do you view that as a core aspect of you know this this human being being involved in as a core aspect of what Stitch Fix does? Absolutely. Um, I think with Stitch Fix, we we use data science and we use a lot of data science, but there's this important human layer of styling above it. And so as a stylist, when I'm styling fix. I can see what the what the algorithm is recommending to me, but it's still my choice of what I'm going to choose and what I'm not going to choose. Um, and that stylist element is so important in building relationships with our clients and um, having making sure our clients feel heard. Um, and so the combination of how they work together is really special. But that stylist role in particular, I think, is really unique as you look to other models. Some IPO investors, it seems, are getting gun shy after Snap, after Blue Apron. These companies that are trying to connect the real world to um, you know, to technology and data. Um, those two haven't done so well since their IPOs, and I think investors are trying to separate hype from reality. So explain perhaps in the context of inventory how you tackle that issue. You've talked about how you had a big inventory problem in the past, learned from that, moved past it. How are you handling inventory, and how are you handling it better now? Yeah, I mean, this is a business that's on a near billion dollar base. We've been cash flow positive for years and had consistent profitability. Um, and so this is a business that I think is proven in a lot of ways. And we have we have really strong contribution margins and profitability metrics to show for it. Um, in terms of the inventory side, actually, one of the things that we're extraordinarily good at is, is turning inventory and moving inventory. And the way that we use data to, um, to drive that is that when people are signing up and they're letting us know their preferences, that actually helps us to make sure that we have all the jeans and the right sizes and the right inseams. Um, so we can actually use data to really power the inventory side of our business. Um, to your point, it, that is one of the harder parts of our business to do. When you sign up and you say, I want a new pair of khakis and I need to be able to have your size and inseam, um, that's, you know, that's one of the challenges in our business. And I think that's you know, a benefit that we now have with this very large scale is that we are able to um, serve many people very well with a broad base of inventory. I think you said you're going to have to start spending more on marketing for customer acquisition. What's the most efficient way for you to do that? Is it through the Googles and Facebooks? We've just seen their earnings. Uh, they've become a very key marketing channel, especially for digital businesses. 
Are there other ways that are becoming important to you? Absolutely. Diversifying our marketing channels has been a big initiative for us. Um, today, we spent about seven, or last year, we spent about 7% of our marketing or our revenue on marketing. Um, that's still very low relative to other e commerce peers. Other e commerce peers, you'll see at 13, 15, 17%. Um, so we, we've been pretty, I would say, conservative on that front, but very effective. Um, in terms of channels, we social digital certainly works well for us, but we've actually seen TV be really effective as well. We like just like to hear that. Okay. It is. Yeah. No, we've had three rounds of TV, and um, they've all been very effective. And um, so we have a very broad mix, actually, of marketing channels that are effective for us, and that's been a, kind of an important part of our strategy is diversifying that mix. Talk to me about culture. You've got a, a company that's got data scientists. You've got stylists. You've got uh, quite a diversity of, of different uh, types of workers and life experiences. What kind of culture are you trying to drive in the company? And do you view it as being different from perhaps what Silicon Valley and San Francisco have had in the past? I think our culture is very differentiated and it's a big source of our success. Um, the diversity of thought, the diversity of experiences, having data scientists working alongside stylists and merchants, um, all of that is so special and I know it's one of the things that I love most about this business and many people who work here do. Um, but I think even just in the abstract talking about how the stylists and the data science work together in styling fixes, for example, is kind of symbolic of the way that we work together and the way that we partner together. Um, and so I think you know, we've been able to create this amazing culture that is, I think, a big driver of success in our business and um, one that I think all of us here share a lot of pride in. Now, talking more broadly about culture, uh, th there have been news stories out. You were sexually harassed by an investor as your company was getting off the ground. There's a non-disparagement about that, but I want to ask you about the conversation that's opened up since in tech and Silicon Valley, and goodness, now it's in politics everywhere, about these issues and gender issues. As you reflect on your experience working past that, learning from it, where do you see that tech is now, founders are now, and where do we need to get to? How do we get there? Yeah, I mean, my my path as an entrepreneur has not always been easy, and I think you know I've learned a lot through that. And um, my hope is that now that there's such a broader conversation about the challenges of many people in many industries across, um, you know, beyond tech, um, my hope is that the conversation moves things forward. Um, you know, I think in venture capital and in tech, we still have a gender issue. There are still um, not enough women who are venture capitalists. There are still not enough women who are decision makers at the top. And um, you know, I hope that at Stitch Fix we can demonstrate kind of what success can look like with a real diverse team. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's that there's change coming. And certainly, having a lot of conversation on the topics, I think, is um, is creating some momentum. What was the initial idea and impetus behind this? Because it, you know, from reading your story, it seems like you were going out looking at uh, various ways to connect in retail, even going out and talking to various founders and, and decided there's nobody out there who's got some brilliant idea that maybe I, sh I should just do this myself. Yeah, when in the founding of Stitch Fix, I um, I mean, I just wanted to work at the retailer of the future. Like I was looking around, and I love retail. It's a huge, meaningful category. It's like a three hundred and fifty billion dollar category that's growing, and yet only only fifteen percent of that is bought online. Um, and so I looked around and I was like, what? However, people are going to buy clothes fifteen years from now, I want to be at that company. And I looked around and I just didn't feel like I saw that. I didn't see, I didn't think it was going to be better stores. I didn't think it was going to be like more filters in e-commerce. Um, and I think this idea of like how, how can you scale the idea of personalization and a personal stylist was really in, intriguing and interesting to me. And I think it's only with what you can do now with data science and all the cool things and crazy things that you can do and how, how you can connect with people that is made possible now. Um, so it kind of was, you know, the right time, right place of just like the technology was there and it was a totally untouched space and, um, and those are kind of the original seeds, I guess. And you didn't grow up around entrepreneurs, right? In a house full, a whole full of, not. of entrepreneurs. <laughs> you, you initially thought that you were going to be a doctor, you know, through undergrad mm -hmm. going to school. Yep. Where did the entrepreneurial idea come in? It's so funny. I mean, I'm, I think about this a lot because I, I 
I wasn't like the kid that, you know, had a lemonade stand growing up. Like my mom is a public school teacher. Actually, she just retired. She was a public school teacher. Um, my dad is a doctor in the public system. Um, and, um, you know, we, I, we didn't have a super like capitalist household. Um, and I always imagined that, yeah, maybe I'd be a doctor. Um, and for me, it was, it ended up just kind of being this opportunity where I was like, I want to work at the retailer of the future. When I didn't see it, I realized that I could start it myself. Um, but, you know, without that. Where did the retail that, part come from? Well, I was working consulting and I was working in retail and restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, like, I loved retail. It's like this huge, meaningful category. People are super thoughtful about what they buy, what they wear. Um, and so I, I just fell in love with the category and I wanted to work at whatever was going to be the future and um, and you know I think when I had the opportunity to, to look around and meet other entrepreneurs I was like wow like I can do this myself. And in your early work on retail and, and customization as a consultant some of the ideas you had people looked at you like you were crazy, right? Yeah I mean th and that was kind of the fun part too is I was working with um, some traditional department stores, I'll say, um, and, um, you know, I had these ideas, it was when the iPhone had just come out, and I was like, what if you could, like, you know, walk into the store, and you could log in, and then you could walk around a store and scan mannequins, and you show up in the fitting room, and all of your things are there, and people just looked at me like I had five heads, like, that's like, you know, that's a crazy idea, and I actually still think that's a good idea, and someone to do that, um, but I, I just felt like there wasn't a lot of innovation happening in apparel, and, um, and that there was an opportunity opportunity to do something totally different. Right now, this phone, I've got an iPhone 10 here, it can scan my face, 30,000 points of information it takes and, and do something with that, with that info. Apple's moving into augmented reality, lots of other companies are. Is that an area that's important for you? Because I imagine one of the steps that people have to take signing up for Stitch Fix is entering in their measurements, saying how their clothes fit. There's some human error mm -hmm. there, I'm sure. How much efficiency could be brought if people could scan their bodies with their phones and give you that data? Yeah, I and mean, we've looked at a lot of the technology. I'm optimistic with the new iPhone that it um, that it may be at a place that we'll be able to adopt it. I think the things that we've looked at in the past um, haven't been accurate enough from a measurement perspective, um, but we certainly look at it all, and anything that's going to help us understand our clients better is going to be something that can be additive to our service. So um, I'm optimistic that you know we'll, people will figure out ways to use the technology better. Um, talk to me about the culture in Silicon Valley. Um, how different was that? Did it take long to adjust to? I mean, you came in as a consultant, started a company, and you know, you're operating in, in, in that culture and retail at the same time. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the world is changing a lot now. Um, one of the sad things, honestly, is that if you look at the top ranks in retail, it's not that different from technology. There are actually fewer women in the top ranks of retail than there are in technology companies. Wow. Um, and it's not just a problem in tech, it's a problem everywhere. Um, you know, I think in tech, some of the challenges certainly are around kind of having more women in VCs like that, more women who are making venture capital decisions, that would definitely be a positive change, I think, from here. Um, but you know, I think in both industries, frankly, there's a lot of opportunity to better show how women can be leaders and show how we can have a more balanced um, kind of team at the top making decisions. Who, what do you notice about the people who have been uh, active on Stitch Fix the longest? Um, I think a really common theme is around just being really busy, I would say. I think, you know, if you are, um, there are a lot of people who want to look good, want to feel good about themselves, but at the same time are not going to prioritize spending a weekend at the mall or spending an evening buying and returning things. Like, I certainly fall in that bucket with a one-year-old at home. Mm -hmm. um, and good so <laughs> I think that, like feeling, like, feeling like you're busy, but also, like, wanting to feel good about yourself, like, that's something that I think is a really strong... Um, it's something that you really see as you know, a strong predictor of people really loving Stitch Fix. So people used to say, if you expect to spend less than 50 bucks on a top or get really cheap jeans, Stitch Fix is not the place to go. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to end up paying a $20 styling fee for the box that comes no matter what. Is this about more a time and convenience discount versus a monetary discount bargain? And how do you communicate that? 
Yeah, I mean, people do appreciate, so I mean, a couple of things on that. I think one, we do, I think today, this 20 to $50 price range is an area we've actually invested in and broadened the assortment in a lot. Hmm. And so in the last year, we launched three obvious new businesses, which are men's plus size and our premium brands. But behind the scenes, we've actually done a lot to expand our inventory to be able to address more price points, more styles. I styled a client um, two weeks ago who's 13, and I sent her I sent her these like leggings with some sheer panels. I sent her um, a leotard uh, with like a mock turtleneck leotard that tucked into high waisted jeans and a Tommy Hilfiger jacket like with the flag on the back. And so that's an example of a fix that like most of my clients would probably be offended to receive, and it was perfect for her. She loved this fix. She kept all five. And so behind the scenes, a lot of what we've do what we've been doing is actually broadening the assortment to be able to address a wider range of people. And so this. Twenty to fifty dollar price point is kind of an element of that. I mean, with Stitch Fix, well, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ask you about that. Styling <laughs> a thirteen year old, how does that work? I mean, um, are parents involved? To what degree are they involved? Uh, that, that seems like a potentially huge market. Yeah, thir so thirteen is kind of the cusp. So you've right. got to, to have an account with Stitch Fix, you need to be thirteen or older. Uh -huh. um, and so she, yeah, she probably had her parents' credit card in there. But <laughs> <laughs> my guess is she had parental permission. Um, but it, yeah, we it, like with her. It's, you know, with, it's so interesting to be able to see like a client, my client who's 13 is going to get totally different things than my client who's 50, who's going to get totally different things than, you know, so it's the diversity that we're able to address through a personalized offering means that each person's fix experience is unique and each person has their own storefront. Um, so it's a real asset of the business is that we are able to offer so many different things to so many different people. Um, I want to talk about back to the, the nitty gritty of the business control. Uh, I've read that you only took about $50 million worth of investment in Stitch Fix. Um, how much of that was because you didn't want to give away the store, to, to, to use a phrase, and, and maintain enough equity to have, uh, to have control as a founder and CEO? We didn't raise money because we didn't need it. We, um, have, we have a proven history of profitability. We've been cash flow positive for years. Um, and you know, I think our, um, our, our reason for raising capital was we raised capital when we needed it, when we could raise it. Um, it wasn't always easy for us to raise money. Um, and so we were very focused on figuring out how can we have a great healthy business? How can we not have to rely on outside parties um, for, for capital? And you know, we've been able to, we've, over $110 million on the balance sheet. We only raised $44 million, and we also launched three new businesses in the last year. So I think us being able to feel like we can stand on our own two feet and control our destiny has been a really important part of Stitch Fix from the beginning. Um, and certainly our approach to the capital markets has been similar. What was the maybe annoying question or, or doubt that you got most often, and what was the most difficult time in building this business? Um, we, I mean, as a business, we've had a lot of challenges along the way. There were times when um, we were, there was a time when we were eight weeks away from not making payroll. That probably stands out as the most difficult time. As a founder, you think for yourself, like, oh, I'm, I'm fine driving my old car and eating cup of noodle and living in my rental apartment. But what you don't think about is your employees. And you don't think about your employees who have mortgages and kids. And, um, and so that was a really stressful time. Um, I forget the other part of your question. The the question the doubters asked you oh. <laughs> um, over and over again that you had to. Yeah, I think you know with Stitch Fix, I think on on the one hand the numbers speak for itself. Like this is a billion dollar business that has a proven history of profitability. Um, on the flip side, I think what's a little bit hard to wrap your head around is like how does the data science how does how is the data science an asset to this business? Like we can share numbers to show that our biz, we people are keeping more twenty two percent more things in their fixes today than there were in two thousand fourteen. Mm. So that's data that we can share to show that. But like really wrapping your head around like well how does the data science impact like the thirteen year old getting a Tommy Hilfiger jacket? Like trying to like get people to um, really understand how the data science impacts the business is just it's hard to articulate. It's kind of hard to get people um, to really understand that part. And so I think that was you know a little bit of a challenge of really helping people to, to see that and to be able to like wrap their heads around it. Well, Katrina, once again, congratulations, uh, founder and CEO of Stitch Fix on your IPO day. Thanks Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.